some amazing insights and some amazing questions by the participants as well. So thanks to our participants as well. Um, and with that, we are moving on to our next session. And our next session is by Noah Gliff. Noah is the uh, founder of Pr uh, Pragmatic AI Labs. He lectures on cloud computing at top universities uh, globally, including the Duke and uh, Northwestern graduate data science programs. He's authored several books to name a few practical MLOps, Pragmatic AI, Python for DevOps, and Cloud Computing for Data Analysis. We are really excited to have you with us, Noah, and looking forward to your session. I can see that you're already there on the webcam. And um, I would like to call you upon on the microphone and hand it over to you from here. Great. Yeah, G glad to be here. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is a, a pretty cool topic, uh, MLOps. Everybody is interested in MLOps. Uh, it's one of those things where it, it really is, um, you know, the, the, the current world we, we live in, we need better machine learning. We need people to be able to deploy their code into production quickly. And this is really one of the things that I, I think many people are interested in. And so what I'm going to cover today is uh, some stuff that I've been working on over the last little bit of time here in terms of uh, a book I wrote for O'Reilly called uh, Practical MLOps, and also some of the material that I teach at universities, uh, including uh, Duke and Northwestern and UC Davis. And, and so, yeah, let's maybe just get started here. And I'm going to share my screen real quick. Let's go ahead and do this. And then uh, what I will do is go into uh, pr presentation mode here and just briefly talk about uh, some of these topics. So to, to start with uh, a little bit about my background, I worked uh, on uh, the first 3D animated pipeline at Disney Future Animation, which was kind of a fun process because this was in 2003 or four, I don't remember the exact year, but they had had a deal with Pixar that was really under jeopardy and so they needed to get their own capabilities up to speed in terms of, you know, Linux and uh, centralized file servers and animation. And what was interesting, again, this is almost 20 years ago, is that that was really the foundation of a lot of the things that we're doing with data engineering today is, is really the film, film industry. So it, it made a big impression on me and I learned a lot in, in being able to move pipelines of data, you know, back and forth. Uh, later, I worked at Weta Digital, which has had one of the largest supercomputers in the world, uh, Sony Imageworks. So a lot of these film studios really gave me this awesome grasp of uh, how to use Linux for big data. In, in the last several years, I've written uh, a few books. Um, recently, uh, I've written three for O'Reilly. I have another one on the way about uh, AWS uh, and C Sharp. Um, probably my last full-time job was uh, a sports social network that I built uh, that had millions of users, global scale. We are partnered with uh, Bayern Munich, which is a top uh, social media brand in terms of soccer. They have, I think, close to a billion uh, people that are that are following them on social media. And uh, after that, I've been into consulting and writing books and, and creating content. And so some of the things I do is I consult with uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 startups and, and talk a lot about ML apps. So that's my background. Let's get into what our agenda is today. I'm going to be covering, uh, you know, why MLOps. So why do we care about it? What's the reason that people are so motivated to do MLOps? We see, you know, job postings everywhere about it. And what are some of the use cases of MLOps? And then also the deep dive walkthrough. We'll go through a, a real world example of how to do some MLOps. And then I'll do Q&A. All right. So to start with here, um, let's talk about the why around uh, why, why MLOps here, and in particular, uh, the, the I think the things that I would like to bring up here is cloud computing is one of these stealth areas that is a little bit under the radar, I think, for many people in machine learning and data science, but it's actually something we should dive into a bit here. So Wall Street Journal, this was uh, reported this on October 6, is that we're close to a million jobs in cloud uh, at, at the end of 2020. I don't know what it is now. It's probably, you know, over a million uh, jobs in cloud computing. And this is up from 2019. There was 400,000 
you know, open jobs. So really the world is headed towards cloud computing because of the fact that cloud computing is the precursor for doing things like deep learning. You can't do deep learning realistically in your own data center. There are always the exceptions that make the rule, but in general, you're gonna to need to move it to an elastic compute environment and that's gonna be the cloud. So if we look at some of these job openings here, you know, you can see that data engineer is on the rise, machine learning engineer on the rise. Data scientist is a little bit of a, a troubled job title right now. And we see this with uh, Zillow, right? That I think things are getting sorted out. We don't really know what is gonna happen with the word data scientist, but we know that there's a, a need for uh, building solutions. So I think that's really what I would recommend you know, people look into is, is how do you master cloud computing? How do you master data engineering? How do you master machine learning engineering? That's where all the jobs are. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about DevOps and MLOps. I think one of the most misunderstood things about operationalizing machine learning is that you cannot do MLOps if you don't have DevOps. And so DevOps, as we know, is extremely important because it's about automating things at scale. Uh, and it's really a continuous improvement. Really, that's the, the whole point of DevOps, make things better on a daily or incremental basis. And so if you're going to implement uh, machine learning in your organization and you don't have DevOps, really you should stop, put things down for a second and implement DevOps. And DevOps, uh, I wrote a book about this uh, for O'Reilly called Python for DevOps. Uh, it's been out for quite a while now and it's, it's actually still selling very well. I think there's a, there's a huge need for DevOps and really talks about how you should set up testing, continuous integration, infrastructure as code, continuous delivery, all those things that improve the quality of your code over and over and over again are, are part of you know, the foundational layer for doing MLOps. Once you've got that, really then the next step is to think about data automation. And in particular, what, what's fascinating about data automation is that it's, it's almost impossible to do anything meaningful with machine learning if you don't have some kind of automation for your data. And, and a good point here is to think about uh, the water system in a city. So if you have a house that you, you're building and you wanna have a dishwasher, maybe like a, a sauna, a pool, all kinds of fancy like things that use water, if you don't have the water pipes going into your house, you can't do any of those things. Is similarly, if you wanna do machine learning, you wanna do MLOps, and you have no form of automatic cleansing of your data, storing of the data, feature store of your data, how could you possibly do machine learning operations, right? It's, it's not possible. And, and so this is a huge, huge aspect of, of what's missing, I think, when people are implementing uh, data automation is think about, about the water pipes that are going into your house. You need to have input and output. And when you're done processing, you need to put the, the, the results back into a water treatment plant so they can clean it. So, so this is really the next level. Then after that, and we'll get into this in a second, is this concept of platform automation. I think many people understand the value of, let's say, a cloud-based build server or cloud-based platforms. But what we haven't really talked about is machine learning uh, you know, platforms. And, and it, how could it possibly be that your Fortune 100 company is able to do machine learning operations if you're writing all the code yourself? It's not possible. So we need to use tools that uh, are out. There's a, many emerging uh, platform automation tools. Uh, there's companies like Aguasio, Data Robot, SageMaker, H2O, all of these kinds of platforms here where people are building things on top because you want to focus on the output which is building machine learning models and putting them into production. Once you have these capabilities in your organization, then you can do MLOps. And I mentioned that the top three things here are really kind of focused more on the ML engineering components and how they're a little bit different from traditional uh, software engineering. So I call this the ML hierarchy of needs. Now, kind of moving on here, the, the, the thing that is really a, a huge component of of MLOps is this concept of continuous delivery. And this is worth just mentioning, this is not uh, specific to machine learning. It, it's actually a, a concept that, that is uh, really an important aspect of DevOps is that you need to have multiple environments. You need to be able to spin up any kind of environment at will. And that's where infrastructure as code comes into play, like 
things like Amazon CDK, where you're able to actually provision the environment, uh, have a master environment, a staging environment, a production environment, build, test, deploy, automatically improve everything. If you don't have this, it's impossible for you to do ML ops. Simultaneously, I think this is where we can really think about some of the aspects of traditional software engineering and how they would apply to ML ops. So for example, in a staging environment, what's, what's kind of fascinating about a staging environment is that you're able to deploy this code and do, a, let's say, a load test. Well, you could also do a production test uh, in a stage environment where you're able to operationalize maybe a, a model that could go into production and you actually go through, verify that the customer feedback is okay, that you're actually able to you know, uh, make sure that the performance characteristics of the model are, are okay. And, and you could call that load testing you know, the machine learning model at scale. So this is, I think, a very important concept, both in DevOps and in MLOps. Now, moving on here to uh, the next uh, topic here, which is data operations, which I mentioned before. You know, again, think the water hookup. You don't have water in your house. You have no dishwasher. You can't go to the local well, grab some water, hike a mile, put it into a bucket in your house, walk back, get another bucket, put it into a bigger bucket in your house, and then expect to have a, a dishwasher, right? Like it just doesn't work. But that's what we're doing with, with a lot of machine learning uh, pipelines. People are thinking that Kaggle is, is some prox proxy for the real world. When it's, it's, uh, Kaggle is a lot like going to the well, grabbing some water and walking back into the village, right? It's, there is no concept of automation there. Uh, so if you have data automation though, uh, what's or data ops, what you can do is you can build things on top of systems that allow you to build at scale. So here's a good example. A data lake is really in its in its um, you know core characteristics, the ability to scale up and scale down elastically with compute, storage, disk IO. Essentially, you have infinite capabilities or near infinite capabilities. And so it's a great thing to build on top of. And then you can have periodic collection of jobs. Uh, you know, ideally with serverless type systems like AWS Athena, for example, or Glue. These are these are the kind of things that you could use to uh, kind of move this data around. And then, as you're building things together, you use things like a data feature store to store those features. And then these again, these serverless tools like uh, Glue Athena could go through and pull those out. And then you could later uh, put those into some other output. So what's interesting about this concept of the periodic data collection of jobs is that there could be actually multiple types of products that you build from a data ops pipeline. So you could build business intelligence, right? And that could be where you would put this into maybe Amazon Redshift and then have uh, you know QuickSight or Tableau you know, read into it. Uh, you could also put it into a traditional software engineering pipeline you know, where you just go through and you use some of that data for something. And then you could also have a SageMaker or some other ML ops platform, you know, going through and like collecting this data, kind of pulling it into models, versioning those models. So I think that's another aspect that's very interesting about data operations is, are there different kinds of products that can come out of the same pipeline? And I think the answer is yes, right? So you can have many different things you're building, not just machine learning, not just business intelligence, not just software engineering products, is that you could have a tree where you're putting all those things into the different parts of the tree. So here's something that I'm, oh, yeah. I need to interrupt, but your presentation display is a little small. Can you just take that? Sure. Yeah, let, let's, um, uh, let's see here. You just this, you mean this diagram right here? Small. Ah, okay. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let's go ahead and um, change this. How about how about this? Ah, okay. How about this? Let's let's make this a little bit bigger. Can you click on present now? Yeah. Let's let's see here. So, presents. Presenter view. Ah, how about that? Is that a little bit better? Yeah, this is this is a lot better. Okay, great. Okay, so in terms of uh, platform automation, uh, one of the things that's important here is that you can see that there's a huge hierarchy here of different things uh, that you're building. So there's 
you know, in an ingestion uh, phase here, there's an exploratory data analysis phase, there's a modeling phase, and there's a conclusion phase. And in a, in again, like a Kaggle type project, you really don't notice the, the scaling aspects of what you're doing. But in a real world project, what one of the things that we, we de deal with here is that you're going to have to use elastic resources. And so this is where a platform is is the only option, right? You, you don't want to be writing all this code yourself. And so you want to use a platform so that you can scale up, for example, training nodes that are maybe GPUs or CPUs, and they'll elastically scale up and scale down, whether you're doing batch-based training uh, or you have regular scheduled training. Uh, likewise, when you're versioning your model uh, or you're pulling data from uh, your, your data lake, you don't want to be manually you know, interacting with something like S3. This is just too much, right? It's too much to, to deal with those resources yourself. Finally, when you're ready to create an online model and do these predictions, you also don't want to you know, be managing GPUs. What happens if your GPUs become saturated and you need more prediction power? You don't want to be you know, juggling these things. We learned all these lessons from cloud computing and DevOps for you know, really years and years and years. And so why wouldn't we be doing these same things when we're deploying machine learning models? So it's really a, an applied type of software engineering problem. And this is where things like SageMaker really make a lot of sense because you also can train the rest of your employees on a common platform. So you don't have to be focused on you know, teaching them some bespoke thing that your company built. That's that's one of the things I think that's a little bit scary even about these these companies that are halfway cloud and halfway unicorn startups is that they start to build their own platforms. And then now they've got this problem where they have to train everybody on the MLOps platform they, they, they built themselves. And I think one of the ways that you could get a lot of um, productivity gains is by actually doing things based on some common denominator, again, like SageMaker, Azure ML Studio, Google Vertex AI, whatever platform it is that makes the sense for your company, because also you can hire people and bring them into your organization and scale up. And I think the bespoke systems have a real problem in that really they're outside of the, of the scope of what your company is trying to do. You're trying to build machine learning models, not build software platforms. So if we talk about this MLOps feedback loop here, I think this is one of the things that's really fascinating is that ultimately, once you've got all those things in place, the idea here is that you do want to have a feedback loop. So you want to have uh, the ability to train and retrain your model. You want to have the ability to deploy and version your model. You want to have the ability to have an audit trail and artifacts. You want to be able to you know, monitor it as it as it goes through and and maybe retrain it when there's data drift and so this is really the concept of an mlops feedback loop is you're not done it's not a static system where you know you just build it once like a bridge it's actually more like a plant and so a plant it has to respond to natural forces like wind rain soil and all those different things uh have to be maintained on a daily basis or the plant will die. S similarly, with a machine learning operations approach, is you realize that you're you're actually designing for change, and that your machine learning model needs to constantly adapt to new data, new business inputs, you know, new new requirements for your business, and and that's really the only thing you can count on is that your machine learning model will change uh, in the future. So another thing I think that's a fascinating part of uh, machine learning operations here is this concept of how do I create something once and then deploy it many times? And I think this is one of the things that we're starting to see with machine learning operations. And, and we see this a lot with um, uh, edge-based devices where with edge-based devices, uh, things like the Google TPU, for example, you can get a small form factor device and you can deploy it to that edge device, plug it into a Raspberry Pi, do license plate um, prediction or detect endangered species in the forest or, or whatever it is you're going to do you're going to deploy and that would be right here on this edge device but you also could take that same model put it into javascript you could also take that same model put it into native mobile ios android you could also take that model put it into a container have some kind of cloud-based container deployment you could also serve it out via an api as well so this is i think another aspect that many organizations need to think about is can you build once and deploy many because you don't want to be recreating every single machine learning model for every single environment. 
the technical complexity of that is just too much. And, and so if you use frameworks where it's very easy to create once deploy mini, this is also going to significantly uh, improve the, the capabilities of your organization. And this is something I came up with that's, uh, I think, different than what many other people think about when they talk about MLOps. Uh, some people talk about the models are the most important. Some people talk about data is the most important. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll throw my hat in the ring here and say uh, I disagree. I think that actually it's a very different approach for uh, machine learning operations. There is no silver bullet. There is no perfect answer um, that it's not It's not like we, we, we made mistakes with, mo with model-based approach and now we know the fix is just data, right? Now we'll fix the data. I would say it's actually different than this. And we see this with the Zillow prediction problem is that, that if you think that there's an answer, there is no answer. And that's the whole problem is that it's a holistic problem. And this is what I call the rule of 25 is that you must have 25% of the problem be de dedicated towards DevOps, right? So if you don't have DevOps in an organization, you know, you're basically dead in the water. Likewise, obviously, you have to have data, right? You you must have some data, and you have to have you know uh, capabilities around that data. And so, yes, it's true. Data is a component of MLOps. Also, ultimately, you're creating machine learning models. So, if you don't have a model that's accurate, you're, you're going to have big problems. But then, here's the part where I don't he he really hear people talking about as much. And this is why I call it the rule of twenty five: is that also what does your business even want? Like, I, again, I don't know what happened with Zillow. But I don't know if the CEO said, we want this kind of a model because we're going to do this. And then maybe the data scientist said, we want, we, we think you want this. But there's some kind of a feedback loop problem where if you don't think that's equally as important as DevOps data and models, you can get problems with, um, you know, scalability of your model in production. And so what is the problem I'm trying to solve? Is it suitable to machine learning? And actually, can we adjust it in real time? If you equally treat all four of those things together, I think you'll have a much more effective uh, MLOps uh, you know, feedback loop. So just I'll also mention a, a few use cases here that I think are, are very well suited to MLOps. So a good example would be autonomous vehicles. So in the example of uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, if you look at things like uh, Tesla, Waymo, what is it? Um, Waymo, I think, is the other one. There's all these different companies that are building autonomous vehicles that that's a, a pretty good use case for MLOps where you have to be able to deploy changes in real time to the cars. You have to get feedback. Uh, that's one of the more complex and interesting you know, uh, use cases for MLOps. Uh, MLOps in production from zero, I think speed is another use case for MLOps. I think many organizations are kind of stuck in research mode and I would call this you know, similar to when we first were building oil pipelines where you would go to, you know, maybe like some dirt somewhere, you know, dig a hole in the ground, some oil would start squirting out of the ground and then people would just be collecting the oil and making a giant mess and then trying to figure out how to get it into internal combustion engines. I think going past that research type environment and getting into to operationalization it is one of the requirements or use cases for MLOps is you want to go quicker. Applied computer vision is another one I think that's really interesting is that there's so much traction now with uh, computer vision and especially with uh, pre-trained models where you use transfer learning. I think that's one of the more interesting aspects of uh, computer vision. And we can see many, many use cases for people uh, applying these computer vision solutions to problems. So you think of machine learning as just part of the new capabilities you have versus making everything about just computer vision. And then maybe a, another use case here that I see a lot in academics is it's really easy to kind of be hand wavy and whiteboard things and only draw equations and all this stuff. And then it turns out that nobody can ever use anything that you build. Uh, how do you get from the, the science lab into a production environment. And this is where MLOps comes into play is that it's really about measuring the, the output, right? Measuring the output of, of what it is that you're trying to build and, and putting it into production and, and making sure that you move past the, the research phase. Okay, so this is a good time to dive into uh, potentially uh, some code here. And so what I'm gonna shift gears here towards is uh, I'm gonna pull up uh, GitHub here real quick. 
and let's just go to github.com open up my profile and i'm going to go to uh, mlops cookbook which is a location where i have a bunch of code mlops cookbook here we go now inside this uh, mlops cookbook here uh, i can actually go through here and uh, uh, take a look at this there we go and what's what's cool about it is that i actually have broken the problem down into into smaller pieces you know and and these smaller pieces are are basically um you know the different sub components of what it is you're trying to build in, in terms of a machine learning project so you can see here there's a make file you know there's um you know a requirements file there's a command line tool so again these are really common um tools that you'll see in a machine learning environment um and and what's what's awesome about this <clears throat> is that each of these components you could go through yourself and, and kind of play around with this um so we have uh you know a csv file here for scaling a model a docker file and in particular once you've got this kind of a cookbook type style set up you could actually go through here and 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 look through all the different components of a project you have a microservice you have a command line tool you have a container and uh, again here what, what's what's fun about this is that you can see you can deploy to many different environments so that's really where we're at in terms of machine learning is that uh, you have tons and tons of uh, uh you know issues here with uh with with taking containers putting those into production and in particular we can see here that uh, another way you can solve uh, machine learning uh, models is to build command line tools. So my personal preference is when I'm building things out is to have lots of different options. So I have command line tools, I have microservices, I have containers. I think those are three of the best ways to focus on building outputs. And all these are very friendly for traditional DevOps workflow. So for example, you know, a Flask microservice, if, it, if it's got access to a machine learning model, we can just pick up that model in production uh, somewhere, maybe S3 or, or you know, other some other cloud storage device. Likewise, if I'm using an Elastic file system, we could actually uh, have lots of command line tools that have machine learning built into them. And so, in a in a larger organization with a um, distributed file system, a command line tool could work out very well for for doing machine learning. Another one is container. So what what I think is so interesting about the container-based workflow is that what we're seeing here is that pretty much every advanced service in cloud computing allows you to do some kind of containerized workflow. Uh, and then once you have containers set up, you can do you know anything. You can do microservices, you can do container as a service, you can do um, platform as a service. There's all these you know really cool workflows that, that are enabled. So to get started with uh, this model, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clone this repo into a new environment. And so I'm going to go over to uh, Cloud9, which is a cloud-based development environment. And what I like about Cloud9 is that it's a, a really easy way to, to get started building services. So let's go through here and start this up. We'll say, um, you know, MLOps uh, from zero. And we'll go through here and create this environment. And by default, you'll get EC2 instance here. I like to make things a little bit larger, especially if I'm working with containers because it allows me to kind of build things uh, with speed. And by default, you'll get the Amazon 2, Linux 2 environment, which I think is a great environment to work with. And uh, let's go ahead and say next step. All right, let, here we go. Here's our environments right here. And this takes typically like 30 seconds or so to, to set up. One of the reasons I think the cloud-based development environments are the future is that it's exactly the same target environment as you're going to deploy to. So why wouldn't you, you know, simulate things in a way where it's really easy to to figure out what's happening? And that's I think a huge advantage of um, using something like Cloud9. I would say if you're on Azure, you should use Azure Cloud Shell. If you're on Google, you should use Google Cloud Shell. Whatever environment you're you're going to deploy to. If you can develop in a cloud-based environment that's that's identical, you're gonna you're gonna minimize a lot of the problems that typically come up in building software. And so, 
The other thing as well is that uh, it auto times out. You have access to large instances. There's just so many advantages, in my opinion, to developing things inside of a cloud-based environment. So here we go. We've got this environment set up here. So how do we get started? First thing that I would do is I would get clone this project. So again, I just click on uh, this uh, clone icon here and, and copy this. Now, the first thing that's going to happen when I when I clone this is that it's not going to like that I don't have a SSH key. So that's just a one-time uh, thing I got to do real quick. And we'll go ahead and set that up. There we go. And then I will just uh, paste these uh, public keys into GitHub. So really, that's one of the few things I have to do is the very first time I set up a brand new environment, I have to tell GitHub about my keys, which is really not that big of a deal. And you can see here how easy it is. We'll call this new keys, cloud nine. Perfect. It'll ask me to off. And once I've authed here, now I'm ready to go. So whoops, let's clear this out and do up arrow, get clone. All right, we're, we're good to go. Now I can CD into this repo right here. And then let's just take a look at some of the code here that we've got. Uh, so I think the, the main one to, to maybe look at first here is this application file. You can see this is a, a, a Flask application. And I have some imports here that import Flask. I also have a library. That is my machine learning library. I think this is something that's probably a good pattern that most people would use is you want to have some library where you invoke your model by just a line of code. And then if I scroll down here, I have a hello world type app. I mean, this is really a toy app, intentionally simple so that you can break this up into pieces and build your own solutions with it. But this just shows that uh, my, my application is working. Maybe I could use this as a health check. And then if I scroll down here, uh, I have a predict uh, method here and I have a, a, I have a predict route that accepts a post method. And it's very simple actually how this thing works because I have a library. I accept the JSON payload, uh, I log my JSON payload, and then uh, as a result, I do a prediction, right? And so this prediction is, is my result for the machine learning model. And you can see right here, I actually run this on port 8080. Uh, what's, what's awesome about this uh, port 8080 uh, style, style flow is I can actually test this out locally. Now, pretty simple to get things running initially if you have a make file. Well, let's talk about the make file real quick. I think all projects should have it. Uh, when I'm working with people and they're struggling, you know, hey, I can't get this to work. I don't know what happened. I'm deploying it to, you know, AWS and something's not working. Almost always those people don't have local testing set up. If you have local testing where you can test your, your application locally, then there's a whole series of things that go away. And, and it's it's hard to describe you know, how important it is to be able to test your application locally. So for machine learning, especially, it's a fairly complex type of microservice. You want to have the ability to test locally. So here I have an install step. I have a test step here. I have a format step. I have a lint step, test. And so really, I can just say make all, but before I do that, I need to create a Python virtual environment because by default, Python is not really great at dealing with ambigu ambiguous environments. We have to tell it to, to look in a certain uh, directory. So I'm gonna say Python 3 dash M V E N V and I'm gonna say tilde dot V E N V. There you go. So this will create a, a default Python virtual environment. I'll source it and uh, go through here, then activate. Now, what we could do actually, and I think this is probably a good idea, is let me just show you what I will do when I'm building things out, is I will actually go to bash like this, and um, I'll put this in my bash RC file, just say like, you know, uh, echo sourcing VENV or something like this, and then just source it. That way, um, I don't have to actually, you know, there we go, sourcing V and V, which Python, I don't have to actually just remember this. It's just which Python 3, sorry, which, uh, which Python 3, there we go, the virtual environment right there. So um, basically, 
we can now CD into this uh, environment and we can just say make all. There we go. So, so really there's just three steps to, to get this project working in, a, in an environment like AWS Cloud9. First, create your SSH key and upload it. Two, uh, create a Python virtual environment. Three, run make all. And I think that's a very important thing to point out. It seems kind of simple, like, hey, why do I need to do this? You know, et cetera, et cetera. But if you build this kind of a local setup here, you'll see how trivial it is to actually test your code uh, because you just run make all, right? And 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 I, I don't need to explain anything to anybody. I just say, create a Python virtual environment, source it, run make all. And I think this is a very important process that, that that would I would recommend people follow because I know that the code works. Now, how do I test it? I just say Python app. There we go, and it's running in foreground mode here. And I can in fact um, open up a new shell here, and let's take a look at um, this predict script. All it does, if we look at it, is just do a curl command, and this curl will will run a prediction against our code. So if we go through here, I do predict here. Let's uh, cd into the right directory here. And we just do the, the predict script. It will predict our code. There you go. So I can just run this over and over again. Um, predict, predict, predict. And we can see that output is right here. All right. So later, if I, if I want to build command line tools, I want to do containers, I want to do all this stuff, there's, there's all documentation that I cover inside of this um, MLOps cookbook directory here. There, there's tons of recipes, everything from App Runner to Cloud9 uh, to Flask to Fast API, all, all kinds of stuff here. Uh, Beanstalk, um, they all work the same way. You have a container, you deploy the container somewhere, and, it, and, it's, and it's in some cases just one line of code to, to get it uh, deployed into production. So probably the, the next thing to, to start with here would be that um, maybe maybe wrap up here in terms of what I was going to cover. So, you know, I guess that's MLOps on a super, super high level very, very, very quickly. Um, let's go into potentially some Q&A here and, and see what everybody uh, has to say. Okay, so maybe, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that was really, uh, really hands-on session uh, towards the end. Uh, I'm very quick overview. I'm excited to actually get into your YouTube and grab some content before I buy your book. <laughs> so, <laughs> just like everybody, I guess. Uh, so we, we do have some questions. Uh, sure. And let's see what... Uh, so... The... Uh, First question is about uh, data automation. When you they, when you say data automation, are you talking about DevOps intelligence and integrating the data from multiple tools in the delivery pipeline? And how do you do this? This is by Atresh. Yeah, I would say that I, I think one of the things that's important to think about when I went through the ML hierarchy is that I think many people now know that DevOps is important, right? I think most organizations realize you need to have automated testing, automated deployment. But I think many organizations that do data science haven't done the same thing for data. And what that means is that the data has to be automated so that it gets it's cleaned and it's ready to go and it's in a format that's usable. So very similar to water, right? Again, you can't just go to the well, pull the water out, <laughs> dump it into your tub, right? It's just not scalable. Likewise, if you're going to do machine learning, you need to have the data pulling through some kind of a pipe. It could be using things like Kinesis, for example, or Kafka. It pulls all the data, it puts it into your data lake. Then you have another process that is creating metadata about that data. And then you're able to have tools that at a high level can query it and then put it into a refined format. So this, again, would be very similar to there's a stream. The stream has pollutants in it. You don't want to just drink that right out of the stream. You want to put it into a water treatment plant. You want to sanitize the water. Once the water is sanitized, you put it into the pipes and it goes to the houses, similar with, with data. And I think that's really the, the paradigm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, next question is by Uma. She asks, uh, assuming MLOps follows DevOps principle, is it more uh, 
dependent on ML platform? Uh, uh, is there a reference architecture you carry? Yeah, I think I think MLOps is very similar to to DevOps in that there's a lot of there's a lot of trade-offs and, and and use cases that are that are similar with the exception that things are a little more complex because you also have data and you also have models. The, I do think the best way to handle this is why work hard? If you can work smart, just use a platform. So if you're already on AWS, I think the first place I would recommend is just use the SageMaker platform. They're only gonna make it better and, and keep increasing features. And I think that's, that is probably the best strategy is don't reinvent the wheel. Whatever, if you're on AWS, use SageMaker if you're on Azure, use um, Azure Machine Learning Studio if you're on Google, use Vertex AI. Just use a platform that's native for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see is that they'll just keep building more and more features and you just follow what they're what they're telling you to do. I think that's the, the most straightforward way to do it. Absolutely. Dinesh has a question. He asks, what's the path for machine learning for someone who's not uh, from backend development background? How does one start? Yeah, so I think what I would recommend is, so a lot of the stuff that I publish is very geared towards those kind of people. A lot of the students that I teach are data science students, uh, you know, either uh, entry level workers, you know, who are 22, 24, or seasoned professionals who've been around for a while but are shifting gear. So if you follow anything I do on YouTube, GitHub, books I've written, they're they're pretty much geared towards that. But I'll also say at a high level, I think getting cloud certified is probably one of the easiest ways to bootstrap yourself. So I think that's a great way to get more and more familiar with it. And I think AWS Solutions Architect and AWS Developer would be two really good certifications that would be helpful to you. Awesome. Um, there's a question by Luke, sir. He asks, uh, MLOps is on the rise. As an industry insider, what's the ground reality? Is it the hype or is it real? I think it's absolutely real. Um, I think there are some things that are hyped that I'm a little skeptical of, like cryptocurrency. I personally am very skeptical. I mean, I could be totally wrong and maybe I'm the only person that won't be rich, but I don't believe in it. <laughs> I, I just it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Like for example, the um, the fact that you're, we already have global warming, people are really worried about the environment and we're just deciding to like burn a bunch of compute power for no reason. That that's hype, in my opinion. I could be wrong, but machine learning operations is not hype. I think it's very very clear that the organizations want to get better at doing AI and ML, and they need to get to the point where they're actually able to do something with it. And they they can't just you know spend a billion dollars for AI and ML and then have no results. And so really, ML ops is is less about hype and more about reality, where you're you're actually demanding uh, results from your team and you're asking them, listen, we, we need to put this into production. We need to monitor it and make sure that it's adding business value to an organization. So I do think it's a great time to be involved in MLOps and it's a great career choice. There's a question by Sudhanthan, and the question is, one of the speakers early on said that it's not a good idea to have staging environment. You said could have a staging environment to have ML ops to get tested. What do you think and say with respect to DevOps? I mean, I, I think with with there, there's a there's a lot of ways to bake a cake, right? Like you can have cake that has flour, you can have cake that has almond flour, you can have cake that has no flour. Like you just have like a you know flourless chocolate cake. Similar with DevOps, I think there's a lot of ways to do DevOps. Um, I think the I personally do like staging environments because of the fact that uh, I can do load testing in those staging environments, and so for me. Um, it's a great chance for me to really verify that the, the production environment is working the way I, I expect it to work. It doesn't mean you always need to use it for every single deploy, uh, but I, I think there are some benefits to, to having a staging environment. I, I'm not 100% against 
humans being involved with deployment. I think it's good to have humans plus AI. Like, like when you're driving, it's good to have some automation, but also have a human take over. Likewise, I don't think it's necessarily always a good idea to be just pushing code without ever having a human involved. And that's where the staging environment adds like a, a safety valve, right? Where you could have the QA team just looking things over real quick. Okay, is it is it actually going to be okay to deploy this? So at least in my world, I think a staging environment is a nice uh, component to doing uh, DevOps. And I think it's also can be very valuable for what you're doing um, for um, MLOps. That that being said, I don't think you should wait like one week before you do a deploy. You could do a you could have a staging environment, and, and it could be in there for two minutes. Uh, it, it's that's just been my experience. I've found them to be valuable. I don't find it to be valuable to have like you know human gatekeepers, like take a take a week to deploy software to production. That's that is bad. The old style. I mean, we did for the production. Uh, uh, reprodu reproducing something in prod that is breaking in something of that sort. Yeah, right. That can be spin up on demand. Next is uh, two questions. Uh, so Priyanka asks, how can we get some more references to get started on uh, MLOps? Well, I, I mean, I would say the book I just wrote is not bad. <laughs> that, that's why I wrote the book was 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 you know to to get people started. And you and you don't even need to read the book to get started. Even the the repo I I I showed you is a pretty good you know starting point for you to just start playing around with MLOps. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so the another question is MLOps the beginning of the end of data scientist as a career hype? that's a good that's a good question i i think it could be i think that actually even though i teach in data science programs that i don't know if data science itself is a job title i so just like let, let's 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 think of some other hot degrees like um an mba like, I mean, imagine how many job titles out there where it says, I'm hiring an MBA. None. <laughs> there, there, there's no jobs that are it's like hiring MBA, right? That That's not a title. That's a capability. Yeah. What they could be hiring for is I'm hiring a product manager who has an MBA, right? That's different. Like, likewise, I think what we're going to see with data science is I'm going to hire a product manager who has a data science master's degree, or I'm going to hire a software engineer who has a data science master's degree, or I'm going to hire, you know, a sales engineer who who knows data science, or you know, something like this. So I, I don't think that the the education part will go away. I, the the job title itself, I, I'm a little skeptical that it's actually a valid job title. Uh, I think at some level, at the elite level, for example, if you're in charge of like, you know, the military or something, or you're like in charge of a fortune 10 company you could have the chief scientist but i mean how many of those positions are there i, I think they're very few but I, I think the data scientist as a job title i i, I do think it will go away which one is more important to you model accuracy or model performance um i would say the accuracy is probably not as important because of the fact that I would add a third component. I would say MLOps would be more important to me than either. In that, um, basically, if you have if you're focused on MLOps, you're focused on change, and so that question, in a way, is like tying you down to either prediction or performance. But I would say what's much better is that your your organization has the ability to make changes quickly and adapt to business requirements. So I would say that's much more important because you can start off with a model that's not very accurate, but if you're able to constantly improve it, then eventually you'll get to a point where it's good enough. And then if it changes in the future, you'll also be able to adapt to change. So I think the, basically MLOps or the ability to adapt to change while deploying machine learning models is the most important. Awesome. Uh, just glancing through questions. 
right? So Guru asks this question, should we keep ML ops and DevOps separate or can we have common pipeline for ML models and application code? Yeah, I would say that they're, they're actually probably two fruit from the same tree. I mean, I don't see why you would 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 have different capabilities for DevOps than MLOps other than the fact that there's some additional components to it. But I, I think many of the same methodologies are 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 in, are in common. So I think it would be a good idea to to combine the, you know th those capabilities as much as possible. So in other words, you're saying machine learning operations is just a a complementary thing that will actually help your DevOps journey much smoother. Yeah, I think it's I think it's an applied aspect of DevOps. I would say MLOps is just like an applied version of DevOps, and so there's no reason why you shouldn't be using many of the same things when you're doing MLOps. Awesome. Uh... Sugandhan has a question. Uh, could we ask DevOps engineer to upskill to MLOps knowledge and skill? Otherwise, uh, hire a dedicated SME to work with DevOps team. What's your recommendation? Yeah, I, I actually think that is a pretty good uh, recommendation. Is if somebody has deep DevOps skills, why not have them upskill to become an MLOps uh, professional? Uh, a lot of the MLOps aspects are really about dealing with data and dealing with models that have been created. And especially if we start to look at tools like SageMaker Autopilot is a great example, it can do a thousand experiments. So, I mean, let's just take this scenario. If you have a columnar data set and you're going to use four or five features and you're going to predict a target, which is, uh, I don't know, classification, you know, fraud or no fraud or something like this, why couldn't someone just click a button and say, you know, let's try it out. <laughs> let's let's try out the, the autopilot and see what it does. And then the person that has all these really strong DevOps skills can easily get that put into production. And then they can work with some people that have experience with, you know, predictive modeling and, and they could learn some of those other skills. So I, I think because there's so much automation happening with machine learning that, the shortest path is probably people to MLOps is probably people that already have DevOps skills versus it's a little bit diff more difficult, I think, for people that are data scientists to do MLOps because DevOps is, is actually a very um, complex and nuanced skill. But again, if you have DevOps skills, I think it's a little easier to go into MLOps. I think at this point, there are no more questions, but uh, I had something in my mind to ask you. Uh, some of your earlier pictures were not really clear. Do you want to show those again? Uh, sure, yeah. A yeah. couple of slides that were not very clear. Yeah, let, let, let's go for that. I got some question once I see some. Yeah, let, let, let's, let's go back here. Um, to, to that, let's see here. Yeah, I think I, I must have, it must have gone, I have a 49 inch monitor, so it just went, so basically, uh, this is one of the things I talked about the motivation. Why do we need it? What is it? Um, how, how the COVID-19 crisis revealed uh, the need for MLOps, how to get started. Those are, those are some of the reasons, I think, for MLOps. And I think if we look at the drug discovery for COVID-19, I think it's a great motivation for MLOps. Like, we want to get better at producing drugs and vaccines, despite what anti-vaxxers say. <laughs> and so here's, here's the, the things where things are headed with uh, Wall Street Journal we see that the cloud computing is just off the charts big, right? Over a million jobs in cloud computing. And then in terms of, this is one of the things I showed earlier, which is the hierarchy of needs here is at the bottom, you have DevOps, uh, 
in the middle above that, you have data automation, you have platform automation, you have ML ops. So in my opinion, you cannot do ML ops if you don't have DevOps, right? So that's why I'm a little skeptical of the data scientists being in charge of ML ops is that do they know DevOps? If they don't, they need to work to learn those DevOps skills so that they can uh, get that first layer down. Then the second step is da data automation, right? If you don't have uh, you know clean data that's that's put into the right location, you can't do machine learning at scale. And then finally, platform automation, I think is another one is, you know why would you be reinventing the wheel, building all these distributed computing um, architectures? Just use a platform, right? Use a platform to do it for you. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about continuous delivery of uh, ML ops uh, here. So I think I think those were maybe the slides that 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 we didn't that we didn't get. And then I also had this data lake concept here, which again I think the, the data lake in a sense is 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 basically in a way like your the water going into your house, where where once it's in there, you can start doing all the automation but you need to actually have some kind of automation to get the clean water into your house. And that's, that's why you have, you know, tools that allow you to clean things up and also have the ability to be scalable. Yeah, no, this is, this is awesome. Uh, so I have a question related to the previous slide. So where you have, uh, not data lake, uh, before that, uh, talk about InfoSec organization in a large company. I don't want to name them. I, I've dealt with a couple of them recently, so not considering any instructions. Uh, those uh, folks in InfoSecurity in or InfoSec, uh, they deal with uh, vulnerability issues and uh, so right from SQL injection down to anything of the uh, kind, especially if they are a consumer company dealing with storefronts or if they are a back-end company dealing with uh, servers and racks, it really doesn't matter. InfoSec is nowadays everywhere. And they are they kind of sometimes slow you down because they get in get you into vulnerability assessments, throw you into uh, a complete tangent with respect to product load mapping because it, you know, it feels like you're getting slowed down with all this uh, things that you have to do to deal with uh, secure architecture. Right? Uh, do you think ML, will, ML ops will help uh, those folks to, to reduce this uh, friction with engineering? Yeah, I think that there definitely what 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 could happen with with machine learning is that because it will be a enabler for other SaaS products. It could be that there are much better SaaS products for info security. Uh, and basically you're able to, to use those tools to do vulnerability scanning. Like for example, with uh, containers now, like we're starting to get more and more tools that can just scan containers. They can, you know, you, when, when products are deployed into production, you can do like scanning on the endpoints. So I think that there will be a lot more automation for info security. Also, in terms of um, you know when you're using a cloud-based platform, that's one of the nice things is that it it, it does decrease the the places that, of attack, right? Because the cloud vendor is is taking a layer and they're securing it for you. Like f the easiest one is is physical access, right? So because they, they manage that for you. You don't have to have security guards that are that are monitoring your data center. So that's one of the reasons why I think the higher level you can go, uh, the more plat pass you can use platform as a service, the more serverless you can use, the more platforms you can use, you know, the cloud, all, all of this stuff, the, the less your security team has to, to work. And also they can use high level tools. So I think, yeah, that will be one of the cases where these tools will will improve the speed. Awesome. Uh, so one last question, uh, and probably you can answer in, in a minute or two. Is ML ops different than uh, AI ops and data ops? Are they stepping on each other? Um, ask this I th I think that I think that they're all related in that in that the but each one is potentially a slightly different product. And so I think with 
um, DevOps, then maybe that's the lowest layer, which is you just, you get some kind of continuous improvement process. And then AI operations would be that you're focused, you, you really just don't care what it is you're, you're, you're producing yourself or what you're buying, you're just using AI. And so you're automating the ability to label images or, or whatever, or use high level tools. And then with um, data operations, you're focused on mostly your end result is data. And so machine learning, your end result is machine learning. So I think there's there's a lot of commonality because they're all about continuous improvement. But in the case of AI, it would be just producing AI products in machine learning, just producing machine learning products and data operations, just producing data. And so there's that's the only difference is just the target. The final thing produced is just slightly different. Awesome. Uh, no, I, I personally uh, feel that you're just, you have a gift for all of us in terms of sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, at very, very happy session. So, Sounds good. Thank you. Really, uh, appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so thank you for this superb session. Over to you, Rupa. Thank you so much, Noah, and thank you so much, Ravi, for wonderfully facilitating the questions coming from our audiences. And uh, Noah, thank you for your time for um, bringing this interesting topic for all of us and share how the MLOps journey can start in an organization. Thank you so much. And I request you all to stay back, and I request all the speakers, Murat, Noah, and Jeff, to come. my co-organizers Ravi, Prashant, Prachi to come on the camera as well. Hi Jeff. Good morning. Or wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> so here I go. One, two, and three. And one more. <laughs> one, two, three, and here I go. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, some amazing session uh, we had by Murad and Noah so far. And now we have a break for 15 minutes and we'll be back with an amazing session with Jeff Williams. So stay with us, uh, grab your tea and coffee and come back soon. <laughs>